Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Dick Krugman. I'm a professor of pediatrics, uh, used to be dean uh, of the School of Medicine here at the University of Colorado. And I'm delighted to be able to uh, host this particular session. Uh, we think this is uh, going to be a terrific hour for, at the moment, the 74 of you who are participants uh, growing by the minute. Uh, it's uh, the way we're going to run this uh, hour is I will be introducing uh, Warren Binford, and uh, she will uh, take uh, her presentation off with uh, Cecilia Ruiz, and uh, we'll have time uh, at the end, about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. Uh, I ask you to put them into the chat. Uh, so that we can uh, uh, look at the questions. Uh, some have come in already. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to have an interesting hour. So let me start by saying that uh, Warren Binford is an international children's rights expert who joined our faculty uh, at the University of Colorado in 2020 to be the inaugural uh, WH Lee for Justice Endowed Chair in Pediatric Law, Ethics, and Policy. She serves on the faculties of Pediatrics, Law, and the Center for Bioethics and Humanities, uh, and the Kemp Center for the Prevention and Treatment of Child Abuse, where she's Director for Pediatric Law, Ethics, and Policy. Uh, Professor Binford is one of the only private citizens in our country who has been allowed to visit numerous border facilities where thousands of children and families in migration have been kept by the US government, including the Walmart in Brownsville, Texas, the 10th city in Tornillo, Texas, and Clint Border Patrol facility outside of El Paso, among others. She was part of a team of lawyers and physicians who discovered over 350 children being held at the Clint facility in a warehouse, loading dock, concrete cells, and tents in their desert in June uh, 2019. After interviewing dozens of children over the course of four days and documenting their mistreatment by the government, Professor Benford and her colleagues went to the media with their discovery. The legal testimonies compiled in Hear My Voice uh, were collected during this harrowing trip. Uh, I want to welcome uh, and turn the panel over uh, to Warren Benford. Take it off, Warren. Take it away, Warren. Thank you so much, Dick. And thank you all of us for joining us today to talk about something that is critically important right now to our society and the work that we do here at the University of Colorado, as well as to me personally and professionally. Um, I just want to open up with this picture of the Clint Border Patrol facility. Um, we arrived here unexpectedly in June 2019. And at that point, I had been sent down to the border on numerous occasions in the few years prior in order to meet with the children who were arriving in the United States and to interview them, inspect facilities, and make sure that their rights were being respected. And basically what happened is that when we walked into this facility, which greeted us with an American flag and, you know, clean, seemingly neat facility, largely solar powered um, outside of El Paso, Texas. What we saw was something that I had never imagined coming across um, in the United States of America. But before we talk in depth about what we found at Clint, I want to step back and give you some perspective about what brought us to the Clint facility in, in June of 2019. Um, in 2017, there was an, you know, and even in 2016, there was a lot of talk about a border crisis. And in 2016, during the presidential election, there was talk about all of these um, you know, criminals and rapists coming to the United States, and we were told that there was this crisis that, you know, we needed to shut down. Um, I will share that, that I am a famously moderate person, um, that, you know, I am, um, have, have not historically been involved in immigration issues. This was very much, um, for me, a children's rights 
issue that as I started to dig deeper after I started to go down and, and, and visit these facilities and, and discovered the, the horrors that we witnessed, I started to look into the history of immigration. And what I'm sharing with you is what I discovered, not as an immigration advocate, which is not my background, but as a children's rights advocate and trying to understand how, how these children came to be before me. And what I found in that process is that the uh, language that was used and the representations that were made in 2016 and 2017 were absolutely misleading and misrepresented what was going on historically um, in the United States around immigration. This is a chart of all of the apprehensions that have been made by um, Border Patrol um, in the United States and, and, and INS and, and ICE, um, INS before it was restructured into ICE and Border Patrol. But in any event, you know, these are all of the apprehensions of people who um, had arrived in the United States without appropriate documentation since the 1960s. And what you see here is that we in the past have regularly had over a million people who came to the United States and were apprehended um, upon arrival or shortly thereafter. And then in fact, we on at least two occasions in two different years had over 1.6 million people being apprehended. And when you look at the last 10 years, what you see is that there were just a few hundred thousand people who were being apprehended. And, um, and, and really what changed was not the number of people who were being apprehended, but rather who was coming to the United States. And you see that over the last 10 years, we've seen in that green section of the bar, an increased number of children and families who were arriving in the United States. And that is in fact, what gave rise to the crisis that we continue to see today. And so we're not seeing anywhere near the highest number of people that, that we've ever seen in modern history arriving in the United States without documentation, but rather more children and families. And what we're really witnessing is a failure to adapt our border management policies and procedures to, um, you know, to acknowledge the new population that's arriving. Historically, we had more single adult, predominantly males who are coming to the United States for work, but that's not the case anymore. Um, and so we're seeing more children, we're seeing children arriving usually older on their own, and we're seeing younger children arriving with their parents or other family members, um, usually between 80 to 90% of the children who arrive in the United States have parents, other family members, or other loved ones who are here and, and ready and able to take care of them. And so these are children who really don't need to be in government care at all for more than a, a few hours or a few days. Most of these children are coming from what we refer to as the Northern Triangle. The Northern Triangle is made up of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras. Um, one of the things that I've looked at in the last few years is I've, you know, discovered, you know, the horrific mistreatment of children in government care in the United States and, and in the care of contractors hired by the U.S. government is that um, the United States has had a century long relationship with the Northern Triangle. And a lot of this uh, revolves around both economics and politics. And if you look at the history of our relationship with uh, Central America, including the Northern Triangle, you'll find that you, the United Fruit Company, which is currently known as Chiquita Banana or Chiquita Incorporated, they changed their name because of some of the horrific history that they had um, in, in Central America, as well as in the Caribbean and, and in South America as well. Um, you know, but basically what they did was they engaged in uh, extractive industry, that they went to these countries, they, they took them over, they, you know, paid people very little or nothing and, um, and, and controlled the infrastructure of, of the countries and tried to control the politics of the country, and then asked the U United States government to come in and protect their economic interests and their control over this region. And when we started to pull out from that you know, micromanagement of these countries that left a power vacuum, which gave rise to, to criminal activities. And those criminal activities are, um, which is, you know, largely um, cartels, which run um, drugs and guns um, and human trafficking, and human trafficking as well to the United States, where in fact, we have huge problems with guns and drugs and human trafficking. And as these cartels start to target the children, they target the boy children for 
the, um, you know, for actually engaging in the criminal activities and, you know, doing some running or, um, you know, providing information about who's making money, you know, who they, who they can extract funds from um, and, and embezzle funds from. Um, and then they use the girl children oftentimes for um, sex slaves. And, um, and we've heard a number of stories during our interviews of children and families who were um, where either they or another girl child in the family refused to become a sex slave, um, which they call girlfriends is, is what the gangs call it, um, to a gang member. And the girl ends up being raped, gang raped, and sometimes decapitated and, and her limbs cut off, et cetera. So it's really brutal. And, and it's these types of activities that are driving these children to come to the United States. And so when you look at you know, where these children are coming from over the last few years, you'll see that um, you know, there aren't as many children most years coming from Mexico, but there are uh, a significant com number coming from Guatemala in particular, and I've seen a lot of this, and, um, and then Honduras and El Salvador as well. So fewer children in the last 10 years coming from Mexico and, and more coming from the um, Northern Triangle. In addition to the gangs that I've already talked about, you know, one of the other main reasons that we see children coming to the United States is because of the climate crisis. So we're seeing here in the US the effects of the climate crisis ourselves. I know that in, in Oregon, which is where uh, I'm living right now during my transition to Colorado, we in the last uh, eight months or so have had both apocalyptic wildfires um, that have blocked the sun and turned our skies a, a you know an apocalyptic red we also had uh, a, you know a, a, an incredibly destructive ice storm that caused you know to my house alone you know thirty thousand dollars in damage and um, and caused our family to become migrants in in January and early February because there was no electricity um, you know and and no heat in our home and throughout the region, actually. And the same is true in the Northern Triangle. Um, we hear about indigenous children uh, in, the, in the highlands who uh, their family is engaged in subsistence farming or in um, fishing. And what happens with the climate crisis is that they're experiencing very extreme drought and the parents are not able to feed their children. This is then becoming, in the last year and a half, compounded by COVID-19, Whereas before, when members of the family um, didn't have enough crops to feed the family, they were able to go down into the cities and do day labor in order to support the family. But because of COVID, those day labor jobs have disappeared. So we're seeing a, a direct impact. We're seeing more hurricanes in the area. Um, of course, there, were, there have been a couple of earthquakes recently that have, have caused a lot of damage as well. So we're seeing the effects of the climate crisis through extreme weather events and, um, you know, such as drought and hurricanes hurricanes and things like that, in addition to other types of, um, you know, uh, physical elements that are happening. The poverty and, and the sexual abuse I've touched on as well. In addition to these, there's a tremendous amount of misogyny in and cultures, which leads to domestic violence. We've had children where, uh, you know, the father basically says, you know, I own you and sexually abuses the wife who then might try and, and, and leave with at least some of the children. And then the father continues to control other children in the family and, and sexually abuses the subsequent uh, girl children says basically, you know, as my children, I own you, I can do whatever I want to you. And the sometimes the children report going to the police and the police basically because of the patriarchal nature of, of the society and communities, they refuse to do anything about it because they, um, you know, believe that the patriarch has total control over everybody within the household. And so we see some children who are um, coming to the United States to, to be with a mother or other family member. Also, we hear stories about uncles who abuse the mother and then they have the eyes on um, you know, an adolescent or pre-adolescent girl. And so the mother tries to escape with her girl children who are coming of age to coming of age adolescents and who are trying to come to the United States to prevent what happened to them from happening in the next generation. And then of course, corruption. When you create a power vacuum uh, that like we had a hand in creating in the 20th century in the Northern Triangle, um, oftentimes that power vacuum is um, filled with, with corruption. And we're seeing that in the region as well. And then as I mentioned, uh, almost all of the children that we interview have family in the United States, they have a home to go to, they have people who can support them. And so when you are in a state of crisis, 
you go to be with family nearby. And in fact, the Northern Triangle is, is you know, just a, a three and a half, four hour flight away. And so we are relatively nearby, about 16, 1700 miles, depending on what country we're talking about. Um, there's been some talk uh, right now about all of the people who are coming across the border. And, um, and so this includes, you know, the late uh, fall, which was the beginning of FFY, uh, you know, fiscal year 2021 um, for Border Patrol. And what you will see here is that there are seasonal um, fluctuations that, that we see with people coming to the United States. They tend to come during the um, early winter and spring months, and then it starts to drop off again in July and August when uh, crossings become especially treacherous and deadly. And so what we saw when there was a change in administration recently is in addition to a backlog of people who were being sent to Mexico um, or, or forced to go elsewhere, um, and many of them were waiting right along the border, and I've traveled to Mexico a number of times in the last couple of years, and we've interviewed children and families who had been sent to Mexico or forced to stay in Mexico, even though they weren't from Mexico, um, we had advised the Biden transition team that you need to be very careful not to reopen the border too quickly because there are so many children and families on the other side that it will create chaos. And in fact, that's some of the chaos that we've witnessed over the last um, a few months as, as you've seen pictures of children in convention centers and things like that. So, um, so walking into this situation at Clint, which is what this picture is, um, I started to be asked to go to different facilities where children and families were being kept in, in 2017 and was very concerned during my first visit where I interviewed a number of families, but then I became increasingly concerned when I was sent back a few months later and was already witnessing a, a deterioration in the conditions in which the children were being kept. In fact, um, you know, during the first visit, it, you know, it, it wasn't perfect. And this was not at the Clint Border Patrol facility. It was an, an, another facility entirely that was designed specifically for, for families arriving to the United States. But, you know, we saw some children who were sick, but not a significant number. And when we went back a few months later, we saw a significant number Number of children who were sick, of parents who were sick. We saw distraught children, distraught parents. People were crying. Um, the, um, the, the head of Department of Homeland Security at the time, Kristen Nielsen, was there at the same time I was. And, um, and it was clear from our conversations with the people who, who legal aid, who worked with these families and from talking to the families and the children themselves and by talking it to the employees who were there that there had been an intentional turnover in the people who were running this facility and the policies and the procedures that they were now following and the way that they were treating the children to the point that we were starting to witness, witness widespread intentional ne neglect on the part of the government towards these children. And in fact, a few months later, we found out that um, a child died right around the time that we were there from the same illness that we were documenting during our, our interviews there. On top of that, there was another very concerning event that happened during that visit. And that was that, that at the same time that we were inspecting this facility, the Trump administration was in court, in federal court that day in Los Angeles in a class action suit on behalf of all of the children that has been um, active since 1985. So it's for all children who are in government custody, um, children arriving to the United States who are in government custody. And the Trump attorneys, the Trump administration attorneys were arguing that there were no, there was no place to put these children and they were asking the court's permission to be able to put the children in an abandoned military base, Air, Air Force base in, in Oklahoma and, and possibly elsewhere. And I literally was on site that day looking at approximately 800 empty beds. I had the list in front of me of all the children who were there, all the adults were there. I knew what their capacity was. I knew how many um, beds were occupied. I knew how many beds were empty. And I realized that literally I was witnessing the US government lying to the federal court about what was going on in, 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 you know, in, in the system and asking to put children in facilities that were even worse than the one that I was witnessing that was intentionally being mismanaged and not providing adequate medical care and, and other sorts of care to children. And so I immediately drafted a sworn declaration um, that was filed in court and the, and the judge ended up denying the administration's motion to place the children there. But then what happened was in the next year or so, 
we documented seven children who died either while they were in government care or shortly after they were released. And this was remarkable because no children had died in the um, 10 years, almost 10 years leading up to this visit. So in, in June 2019, I was asked to do two trips to Texas. One was in East Texas to the place where you've seen the pictures of kids in cages. And the other one was to El Paso. And we weren't sure where we were going in, in El Paso, but it was clear that there were a significant number of children coming across the border and that people didn't know where they were, that there were families who were waiting for children and they weren't being reunified with the families. And so we were trying to figure out where the children were and um, because I'm constantly trying to balance family and work, um, I, you know, I, I told them that I could go to one facility but not the other. And the team who went to the facility with the kids in cages called and said they were absolutely horrified by the conditions that they saw there, that the, the children and the families were shoulder to shoulder, everybody was sick. There were like, you know, children who had to be sent to the ER immediately by our team there. There was a, a young mother who had just had a C-section who was, you know, put into a cage with a, um, you know, with in a wheelchair and, um, and a, a lymph uh, premature baby in her arms and no care. She yeah. wasn't able to nurse the, the baby. She wasn't producing milk. Um, she could barely function herself. And they let us know that we were witnessing um, white, widespread neglect and overcrowding of these children. And so as we prepared for the visit the following week, week and you know, just before I flew down to El Paso, we received word that it appeared that children were being sent to, um, at least some children were being sent to an adult facility uh, called the Clint Border Patrol facility, um, you know, which is pictured here behind this fencing and, and you know, and the razor wire. Um, but we didn't know if we we're gonna find any children here. We didn't know if we were going to have, see, you know, four, 12, 40 children here. And we walked into the facility and we sat down and it wasn't our full team. And they handed us a roster of 352 children. And we panicked. We had no idea where these children were, why they were being kept there. And so we knew that the facility was only licensed for 104 men. And so we immediately asked them to um, take us to where the children were so that we could see where they were being kept. And they refused. They would not let us out of the front conference room. And so we, you know, we argued with them for a while. And then finally we said, okay, fine. You bring us the youngest children. You bring us the children who have been here the longest and you bring us the, 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 the teen mothers or child mothers. And when they started to bring those children into the conference room, the children just burst into tears. They were, they were crying, they were dirty, they were hungry. Children climbed up on the conference room table and fell asleep. Children curled up in you know, the chairs and fell asleep. It was you know, the most distraught group of children that I've, that I've ever seen in the United States. And we interviewed them nonstop all day that day. And we were asking the children, where are you staying? And it made no sense. Some of the children described um, jail cells, which we assumed were you know, the interior cells, detention cells where they keep the men. Um, but then other children were describing what sounded like a warehouse or a loading dock or something. And, and what ended up happening is at the end of the day, we interviewed children nonstop all day that day. And, and it was just absolutely heartbreaking and exhausting to listen to their stories and, and what was happening to them. And some of the children had been there for weeks. Um, other children described being kept in the tents in the desert. Um, and so afterwards, the last car, I was in the last car of people who left and we were driving around and I saw this warehouse and it looked like a brand new warehouse that had recent, recently been erected, the children described that there are virtually, you know, almost no windows in the warehouse. And as you can see here, there are no windows here. And I it was like, oh my God, they're keeping the children in the warehouse. I think they're keeping the children in the warehouse. And in fact, um, we asked the border patrol the next day and they wouldn't confirm it. And so we asked some of the older children to draw a picture of where they were staying. And one of the children drew this, um, you know, this drawing of where they were staying. And you will see on the right-hand side that there are nine 
um, you know, baños and, you know, nine little bathrooms. And in fact, I went back to the pictures that I had taken of the outside of that warehouse and there were nine um, porta potties um, right in that location. And then there were also trailers in the pictures um, that I had taken of, a, you know, a, a trailer here, which apparently was, you know, some sort of a medical trailer and then ducha. And what the children had said is that trailers had been brought in recently in order to, um, you know, in order to give them showers. And they, they had started to shower all the kids for like, you know, I don't remember if it was four minutes or six minutes each, but in any event, um, shortly before we arrived. And there is the nine porta potties that I mentioned that confirmed for us that that in fact was where they were keeping the children. And then you can see that there are two trailers here that are positioned just like the little boy wrote, um, you know, for the emergency trailer as well as the shower trailer. And then next to it, you will see that those are the tents in the desert where they were keeping some of the other children. Um, we try and conduct trauma-informed interviews of these children. And, and so as they, as we were asking them, you know, who they are and where they came from and what it's been like since they came to the United States and stuff, it was very interesting to me that many of the children, um, despite their um, a despondent. I mean, some of the children were so despond despondent that they did have, uh, you know, mutism or um, they were unable to speak and others couldn't stop crying. But some of the children would draw pictures of their family and tell us about their, their family or draw us pictures of their homes, um, you know, hearts and flowers and, you know, how they got here to the United States. Some would draw a picture of a bus and some would draw pictures of their home with, with um, you know, mountains and lakes and trees and things like that. And so many of these children very much remained um, children and childlike. And so when we left the, um, we called the uh, children's attorneys who handled the class action suit that first night to let them know what we had discovered and, um, and combined with what they had, our team had witnessed the week before, um, you know, in, in outside of, uh, in Eastern Texas, we'll say, um, they decided to bring a TRO uh, using the children's declarations, um, asking for an immediate halt to this widespread mistreatment of children. The children were not being released. They were as they were supposed to. They're only supposed to be in border patrol stations, if at all, for no more than approximately 72 hours. And they are supposed to be released to their families within 20 days. And it was clear that that was not, not happening from the conversations that we had both with the children and with their families. Um, in addition to that, I decided after I left that I wanted to um, file a report with the UN Human Rights Council so they knew what was going on. This is, you know, I'm a lawyer. This is what lawyers do um, is, you know, we file legal documents in order to draw attention to this. And after the second day of interviewing the children and, and just seeing that the level of mistreatment and um, and and seeing that this was actually intentional and, and there is a document that um, was leaked from the White House um, that became in the custody of Senator Merkley, it became clear that this was actually all part of an intentional uh, development of different policies to make coming to the United States so brutal for children that, um, you know, the children stopped coming, families stopped coming, parents stopped sending their children um, if it was bad enough for the children. And so it became clear that this was actually, you know, an intentional policy to mistreat children in the hope that it would lead to a drop in migration but let me just go back and say that, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is I've actually, you know, I'm trying to do research to understand what I've seen. I noticed that some of the research says that when you in implement really regressive or restrictive or harsh immigration policies, it can lead to an increase, not a decrease in immigration policy or in, in, in immigration. And in fact, what you see is that after these really harsh, they started being implemented in 2017, that we had an increase in migration in you know, irregular migration in 2018 and an even bigger increase in migration in 2019. So what the research shows about harsh immigration policies in fact is what we started to see in the United States. So let me just go back to the slide that I, that I was on. Um, so, um, you know, so I took these actions and supporting the attorneys in Flores to use the children's declarations to try and um, stop the mistreatment of children, um, you know, in federal court. And then I also uh, filed my own filing with the Human Rights Council in order to have the international community take a stand against the um, intentional and, and um, you know, and um, 
it, the intentional mistreatment of, of the children who were in government care. In addition to that, um, we were told by the children in Flores that for the first time since uh, there, since 1997, um, that we were um, asked to speak with the media and let them know. And, and the reason why historically we never speak with the media is because these testimonies and the reports that we do on the facilities are intended for the federal court and that it's not intended to play out in, in the public sphere. But things had gotten so bad with the children dying, what was seen the week before in Eastern Texas, what was seen you know, that week in Western Texas, it was clear that more children would die if these um, you know, policies and practices were able to, to continue. Um, and in response to that, we went to the media and we had um, both President Trump and Vice President Pence um, talk specifically about what we were doing and they said that basically we were lying and that we couldn't be trusted and vice president pence um, after the second week when this media storm ensued and um and it wasn't dying down president pence got on air force two and he flew down to the facility where our team had been the week before and literally they cleaned the children up they fed them, they put them in clean clothes. We recognize the clean clothes because it was the uniforms that we see them put the children on in a, in a family facility nearby. And so we recognized it immediately. I talked to our team who was there uh, just a couple of weeks prior. I was like, is that how the kids were dressed when you were there? And they were like, absolutely not. You know, they were dirty, their clothes were dirty, their clothes were torn, you know, they were, they were crying. This is, this is a whitewash. And, um, and then what the uh, administration seemed to do is they sent a team of religious leaders into the Clint facility, and those religious leaders literally lied about me and misrepresented um, you know, what my experiences were. They had never talked to me about what my experiences were. And, um, and so they went on Fox News and tried to discredit me. And I realized that what we were witnessing was a intentional erasure of these children and their experiencing experiences and what was happening um you know at the, the u.s border and so i decided that i needed to like you know stop just focusing on the law and i needed to turn to you know the creative community to help us to you know, spread the word throughout society about the truth of what was happening. And, and I and some other people who were involved in, in these visits and discovering them partnered with um, Women Lawyers, Lawyers of America. And, and we founded a nonprofit organization called Project Amplify. And basically what we did was we reached out to the music art and, and um, general community um, and asked them to read the children's declarations, which we put online on a website and to um, write songs about them to write plays about them, to create musicals, to create art exhibits, etc. And the outpouring of volunteers was overwhelming. So, you know, this Ghost of Abolito um, by Kristen Granger of True North Duo ended up being a semifinalist for a um, for a Grammy this year in the folk category. And, um, and we had this um, wonderful, we had these conceptual artists from around the world create all different sorts of um, artwork in order to, after inspired by the children's declarations. And, um, and that art was exhibited just one mile from the White House. And we had the comics community come together and they created a comics book um, that was in, in taken, a, a large number of the comics were taken directly from the children's declarations and, and other comics were about other aspects of the border crisis. We had the Broadway community come together and film readings by famous and not famous um, artists. This is, you know, one by David Schwimmer um, from Friends and read the children's declarations in their entirety without any alterations, any, any condensing or anything. We had the um, theater community in Chicago, the musical theater community in Chicago do a series of, of songs um, a, a, as a fundraiser to, to help these children. South Park um, did their first episode in season 23 um, and on a takeoff of, you know, what happened to the children at, ten, uh, at Clint, excuse me. And then um, one of the most remarkable 
uh, undertakings was the creation of this, of this book. And Cecilia Ruiz uh, is with us today. And I am so grateful that you're going to have the chance to hear from her because this is the beautiful cover that Cecilia created for the book. The book is taken entirely from the children's testimonies, except for the front matter and the back matter, but it's taken entirely from the children's testimonies in their own words, and then it's fused together in a mosaic um, so that you can meet these children, hear why they came to the United States, find out you know, what their experiences have been um, since they came to the United States. And, um, and what happened was we reached out to Cecilia in the first few weeks in the summer of 2019. We didn't know how to make a children's book. We didn't know, you know how it should be illustrated. We didn't even know how long it should be. And Cecilia walked us through that whole process. She's the one who told us that, you know, what the length should be. She's the one who suggested that we use uh, you know, a, a, a group of artists. So it ended up being 17 Latinx artists. And, um, and then we, Cecilia brought together that first group of illustrators. And then we reached out to another person who was more from the, um, you know, the digital world in California, and they created another group of illustrators, and Cecilia helped to organize all these illustrators in order to bring to life through pictures interpretations of what the children's experiences are. So I'm going to hand it over now to Cecilia Ruiz. She is the, um, she is a uh, faculty member at Queens College. She's an author, an illustrator, a designer, and I am so, so grateful for everything that Cecilia has done to bring this art, this book to life. So C Cecilia. Uh, I don't know how to turn my video on. Uh, I think someone else has to do it for me. Cecilia, if you go to the bottom left-hand corner on your screen where it says stop video, if you click that, it will turn your video on. Uh, it seems like the host has uh, has stopped me being able to turn my <laughs> my video on. Paul, can you please help Cecilia so that she can turn her video on and share her screen? Cecilia, in the meanwhile, would you like to go yeah. ahead and share your PowerPoint while Paul's taking care of that? Absolutely. Okay, I think now I'm going to be able to. Oh, yeah, here I am. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I I I want to talk first quickly about how I got involved in this project, um, and uh, how how it how I got to start with this. And um, I have to give a shout out to Brandon Curl and. Dale Austin, who were the ones who contacted me initially, and they were the, the people that had the vision for this picture book. Um, so they contacted me and they, they asked me if I would be interested in illustrating the, the declarations. Uh, they said they had the idea to do a picture book and to kind of turn the declarations into, into a continuous narrative that could then be turn into a book for children. Um, and I took my time, I read the declarations um, and I have to say, I didn't know that it was going to work. And I was actually this weekend, I was going back um, reading my emails with them. Um, and I, I was very, very skeptical about turning this into a, a children's book. I think I was, nervous about it. I thought this was very adult content. Um, so I was, I didn't know how it could be done. Um, they also said that time was very limited. They asked me if I wanted to illustrate the whole thing as a whole book, um, which seemed very difficult to accomplish um, just one person. So that's when the idea of bringing more illustrators became uh, a good solution for the book. And then um, the more I thought about it, and now that I can't see the actual thing, I think the idea of bringing a big, um, 
group of different illustrators was the perfect solution for this book. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to Brandon and Dale because they really had the vision for this book and they they were very um, they really pushed this vision and and I have to say it's it works beautifully. Um, so I I want to also talk just about what we do illustrators and what our job is um, when someone asks asks us to to illustrate a book. Um, I was reading through the Wikipedia the definition of what an illustrator does. And it says, an illustrator is an artist who is special, specializes in enhancing writing or clarifying concepts by providing a visual representation that corresponds to the content of the associated text or idea. So in other words, we illustrators create art with a purpose. And I think this is very important to highlight because we are constantly in service as artists. We're in service of something, or in the case of this book, uh, in the service of someone. Um, we turn stories, ideas, and feelings into images. Uh, in a sense, we make the invisible visible, which is um, what I think happened beautifully in this in this book, when I got to read the, the declarations, it was really, really exhausting. Um, it was just pages and pages and pages of text. Um, so through the art, uh, we were able to give face to this text and to these people. Um, so this is one of the main things that we do as illustrators, we give face um to words uh, but also sometimes we get to show what is not in the text um, and i think this illustration in particular does that very beautifully you know the text is just saying i'm from honduras i came from mexico but it is through the the imagery that we see beyond the words. Through illustration as well, we're able to stretch time. It is not the same to read, I've been in this facility for three days, I've been here for 11 days. Um, it's not the same to just read it, but to look at it and just see how time is passing for someone inside an enclosed space. And then as illustrators, we are also able to simplify complex ideas. And I feel like simplify maybe is not the right word because I don't want to say like it sim simplifies things, but it condenses condense information or encapsulates complex ideas. I think this illustration is also very, very successful because again, we're able to see beyond the text. Um, this, this, te this part of the text says, one of the guards came in yesterday afternoon and asked us how many stripes were on the flag of the United States. We tried to guess, but when we were wrong, he slammed the door. Um, so, we see the text and then we see the image and we're able to connect the fence with the stripes and then the stars uh, that are on the ground broken but there's one star still standing in the sky um, waiting to be reached by this this little girl um, so again illustration and art it just gives us the opportunity to see beyond what we are reading. Um, so when I was approached by uh, Brandon and Dale, um, they asked me, would you want to illustrate the cover? 
since you don't think you can illustrate the whole thing, would you be okay illustrating the cover? And I said, of course, I would love to illustrate the cover. Um, so a cover is something that is very different from these other parts of the story, because these parts of the story, they are attached to, to text um, and to a, a specific um, moment in, in the narrative. However, the cover is just a distillation of everything. And it really has to encapsulate, encapsulate the whole thing. So what I started doing as soon as I uh, was giving this assignment, I, um, I tend to write lists of things. Uh, I had read the testimonies. So I had, I had I, many, many images, many, many ideas. I obviously also did some research I heard Warren's interview in, um, what's the name of that podcast? Warren Safe Pod America. Um, you know what I'm talking about? You were, yeah. I, I heard an interview of you in a podcast. Safe Pod oh, America. Pod, Pod Save America. Pod really? Save America, yeah. yeah. Um, so I had all these, all these images, so for, for the cover, you know, I wanted to show the long and arduous journey that these children go through. Um, the idea of escape, of fleeing some some place, um, the idea of encountering a barrier, multiple obstacles, the idea of being in an enclosed space, the idea of being separated, the idea that there's the other side. Uh, not where someone is at the moment. And I also wanted to add a little bit of hope in the cover. Um, I had also images of water, desert, thorns, walls, barbed wire, rain, cages, uh, and the sky. One thing that is a constant for these kids when they do the journey is the sky. Um, and then they end up in this enclosed space without one. Uh, so I just wanted to share some of my sketches, um, some of the ideas I sent through, apart from the cover that ended up being the final cover. This idea um, focused focus more on the barrier. That, that's what was prioritized here. I wanted to show layers of um, obstacles and then um, what should be the end of the journey kind of becomes the beginning of another journey. Um, so this was sketch number one. This was another idea as well here, kind of prioritizing more of the narrative, not any moment in particular, but just a sequence of multiple moments from the escape until the detention. And then the last one here where the, the focus and the priority is on the, on the child um, to, to show, yes, show the, the journey, the long journey, the multiple layers of of difficulty, but then to show the face of the children and to show kind of like that's that's their childhood. Um, so this is the cover that they ended up going for. Um, and this is the final art of it. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I don't know if you want to ask anything, Warren, about. Yeah, so let me just ask you one, one question, Cecilia, and then let's open it up to questions from the participants. Um, so when you read the children's declarations in mm -hmm. their entirety, um, did that affect you at all? And if so, how? What was your response to reading those? 
yeah, it was brutal. And um, it, it was at a moment when uh, the, all this started blowing in the media. So I was aware that something was happening, but I didn't really know. I didn't have the details. So this was my first encounter with the reality of, of it. And it was devastating. Um, and it was really difficult to, to envision how to illustrate this even though at the same time I really wanted to do because I, I knew that it was a, a way to putting it out there and to, to bring this reality to more and more people. So it was difficult. And I talked to some of my colleagues as well who had to, to illustrate some of the uh, art um, and they had the same struggles too. It was, it, it was difficult, uncomfortable, um, but it felt very necessary. Yeah, it's interesting because we, um, I received a number of calls from some of the comics artists as well. And they talked about the fact that they were having a really hard time reading the children's declarations and that they were, you know, they, that they were full of despair and uh, it was causing some of them to be depressed and everything. And it really helped me you know, I'm not an artist and it really helped me to understand the way that artists have to take human experience and transform it. And the fact that it is, you know, incredibly self-sacrificing in some ways, because you have to let things into your being, into your mind, into your heart, into your soul, and then transform it into something, you know, constructive for society. And did it help you to process by creating that cover? Definitely. Definitely. I, it feels like it is like a digestive system, uh, mm -hmm. the creative process in a way. Um, you take in and you take in and you need to let it sit there for a while. It, it doesn't come out right away. And sometimes you don't even know if it's going to come out. And sometimes it doesn't come out until very later on. Um, but it definitely helped me process it in a way because I was more informed um, and this prompted me to do more research to learn more about it um, and and then the exercise of translating it into an image um, and trying to to give face to this situation in any in, in a way uh, it definitely helped me process yeah, that's interesting. So I, I find the same thing with the legal work that I do. If I, you know, know that something bad is happening, if I can draft a motion, if I can, you know, do a UN filing, if there's something I can do with it, it, it makes me feel, you know, more, uh, less impotent, you know, yeah. regardless whether or not it has an impact, at least I know that I'm trying and that seems to, you know, help. Let's go ahead and open it up to some of the questions from the floor. Um, I see that, um, you know, Julie Myers is asking who Flores is. So basically Flores Council is, um, is some attorneys from the 1980s and it's the same attorneys for the most part. You know, they're, they're, they're basically what happened was in 1985, an attorney in Los Angeles, Carlos Holquin with the Center for Human Rights and Constitutional Law heard about a girl who was being held in an abandoned hotel by, uh, by, at the time it was Immigration and Naturalization Service, INS, and they were holding her in this abandoned hotel behind razor wire with unrelated adults. Um, she wasn't being fed healthy food. She wasn't allowed to go to school. There was no recreation. And, you know, there was this pool that was um, just empty, you know, no water in it or anything. And, um, and she was subject to strip searches. And she had come to the United States to be with family, to be with her parents. And, um, and the family was a mixed status family. So some people were documented and some people were not. And the parents who were not documented sent other family members who were documented to try and get her out of this facility. But INS refused to release her to anyone else but the parents. And, um, and basically what they were trying to do was use the child as bait to bring the, the parents forward so they then could deport the parents and, and, and the daughter. And what ended up happening is Carlos 
did some more research and found out that there were children being held in other places around the country in similar conditions. There was another girl in Texas who was being subject to vaginal searches by the INS uh, agents. And so he and one of my mentors, Alice Boussier from the Youth Law Center brought a lawsuit on behalf of the children. It was a class action suit. And at the time it was like 150 kids. That lawsuit was litigated for the next 13 years. It went all the way up 12 years, all the way up to the US Supreme Court, all the way back down again. Sometimes the court sided with the children and sometimes the court sided with the um, government until finally both parties got together and said, let's just agree on some basics. We're going to feed the children in our care. We're going to give them access to running water. We're going to give them access to toilets. We're going to make sure that the environment is safe and sanitary. And we're going to release them as quickly as possible to, in order of preference, parents in the United States, other adult family members in the United States, if there are no parents or other adult family members in the United States, then another adult in the United States who's authorized by the parents, not by the government, but by the parents to take care of these children. And only if there's no parent, other family members or other adults authorized by the parents to care for the children in the US does the government need to take care of the children. And generally, there's only like, you know, around 10, 15% of children who need to be in government care. And normally that's, that's foster care. And so what was supposed to happen is that the government was supposed to make the Flores settlement agreement into regulations in, in, you know, changing border management policies and procedures with regard to children, but they didn't. Clinton never did it. Bush never did it. Obama never did it until finally President Trump did it. And guess what? What he introduced in late 2019 bore no resemblance to the original floor settlement agreement. And so the court rejected the, the Trump regulations. And currently that's being litigated right now in the Ninth Circuit. You know, I participated in that as, as a friend of the court. And um, it is um, currently continuing to be litigated because no administration has ever implemented into um, either regulatory law or legislative law. Congress has never made this the law of the land. And so they continue to send florist teams into the facilities to make sure that the children's rights are being uh, respected. So that's who Florist Council is. Um, as far as buying the book on Amazon, you can buy it anywhere. The royalties go 100% to Project Amplify. Um, you know, I have never received a dime from any of this. I never will. Um, this is all about trying to get the kids legal protections, get their voices out there. Um, somebody asked how we can make sure that the um, people in power know what's going on, have copies of this book. You're welcome to purchase the book and send it to your members of Congress. You are welcome to, um, you know, send it to anybody in the administration, anybody who is an influencer, um, send it to them. We are trying to ourselves get these book out, books out to the right people so that they're able to read what's happening to the children, give it to your friends, give it to your relatives, people that you know don't really understand what's happening on the border. In addition to buying the book on Amazon where it's number one in a number of categories, you can also buy it at your local indie bookstore. Um, the reading of the book, um, so the, the Flores exhibits is a reading of most of the exhibits by, you know, you know, different members of the community, including members of, of Broadway. Um, you know, we, there are bookstores that are hosting, you know, readings and discussions of the book, and you're welcome to try and help organize one of those. The illustrators and, and I, there were over 100 people who, who were involved in the making of this book, including the, the children themselves. Um, but the children, of course, are in a very vulnerable position, so they are not out in the public, but the illustrators and I are happy to support you in whatever efforts you're making to get the, the truth about what's happening on the border out there. Um, so, Martuza, Juan, yes. Let, let me stop you. We've got uh, about a minute and 30 seconds left. Uh, there was one question that I obliterated inadvertently on um, that basically was asking, has the UN or UNICEF or anyone come back with sanctions uh, <clears throat> toward the US? And is the current administration, what's the current administration doing? Uh, I wiped out that question. If you can answer that in a minute, uh, I'll give you, I'll close with the last 30 seconds. Yeah, so I have um, been at some of the facilities um, the same day that at least, you know, 
on, uh, on the Mexican side of the border. I don't know that any of the UN delegations have been let into the United States facilities on that side of the border, but I know that I have been to at least one facility on the same day as a UN delegation. I know that I'm not the only one who has submitted filings with the UN about what we've discovered at these facilities and the Human Rights Council right now is preparing a report on the US with regard to this. Um, you know, what they're going to do with that is hard to say. The UN is very dependent on the US for financial support. And so unfortunately they sometimes are not as um, vocal as they could be in their criticisms of the U.S. when we violate human rights here. Yeah. Uh, the last question really is, uh, is anyone going to be able to keep track of the children and see what the long-term, uh, what the long-term impact is going to be? So yes and no. Um, there's no official effort to keep track of the, of the children. I can tell you that we currently have several letters of inquiry out to foundations asking them to fund the creation of a truth and redress or truth and justice commission. And the idea is, is that we want to create safe space for children and families to share their experiences um, arriving to the United States from 2017 to 2021. And, um, and as part of that justice or redress, we want to connect them with um, pediatric, mental health, legal, and social work services. Um, we have not heard back from any of those foundations, but if we do, we will certainly be reaching out to the University of Colorado community and then all of these professional societies nationally to try and get these children and families connected with the services that they need to recover from the tremendous horrific trauma that they've been subject to over the last few years. So with that, thank well, you everyone. That's terrific. I, uh, I suspect that uh, the hundred plus people listening to this have been this is now the second time I've watched this and it's, it's even better. Uh, I wanna thank you, uh, Cecilia. Uh, thank you very much uh, on behalf of everyone who is with us. And now I'm being asked to start my video uh, and I'm actually here so I can do this in person instead of from a picture that's seven or eight years old. Thanks so much, this was terrific. And I hope uh, those listening, if you have other questions, uh, you can uh, reach us all by email or the web. And uh, I'll throw up my, uh, I, oh, I, would, I wanted to applaud, but I can't do it here. Thanks very much. Yep. Uh, we're done. Appreciate Thank you. it. Bye -bye. Thank you, Dick. Thanks, Cecilia. Thank you, Mark. Okay, bye now.